The number one argument married couples have is not whether to install hardwood or tile. It's the argument over money. And today, it's all we're talking about as we continue our series, Mixtape. Welcome to Stage Press Church. Right now, we're trying to reach our deployed heroes with the love of Christ by sending them packages while they spend their holiday season away from home this year. You can donate to send a package at sagebrush.church hero. Next weekend, we will be recognizing all of our veterans at our in-person location as we'd like to give them a special thank you. So please, invite anyone you know that has served or is currently serving and visit our website to find the location closest to you. Money is not an easy discussion, but it's critical for couples to be on the same page. We'll get into every detail, but right now, let's join together in worship. Well, welcome as we spend some time singing to our great God today. We also have some friends that are declaring their love for Jesus through baptism. So let's welcome them now. Yeah, as we spend some time singing together. Shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. There is one, only one, where my help comes from. Oh, so lift your eyes, lift your eyes, there is a King of glory. There is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name, so hope in the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns. I know, I know. Yes. The nations bow, mountains shake at the sound. Just one name over all Jesus reigns. I know, I know. Yes, there is the King of Glory. Strong and mighty, freedom is in his name. So open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion rolling, Jesus the King of glory. There is a lion rolling, Jesus the King of glory.
mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Set me free. There is a grave that holds. 
in your word you tell us that if we seek you with all our heart that we will find you and what that tells me is that you want to be found and God that's something I still can't fully understand that you the creator of the ends of the earth that you the creator of the universe who gives us the very air that we breathe that you would want to have a relationship with us but God I know one thing I don't want to waste the opportunity to know you more and to make you known. Jesus, thank you for the, the precious gift that it is that we have relationship with you because of what you did on the cross. We thank you for that today. We worship you. We sing for you and only you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for singing with us. You can take a seat. Oh, no, he didn't. Tell me you're borrowing this from work. I know it's a bit much, and money is tight, but... 
could really use it for work. Crunch the numbers and we can afford it. We just have to cut back Crunch on... the numbers? Why didn't you talk to me first? What if an emergency comes up? Something unexpected? We'll be fine. You're healthy, I'm healthy. There's nothing to worry about. We're having a baby. We're... you're... we're... We're having a baby? This is awesome! You're gonna have to call your mom. I, I'm gonna have to call my mom. We're gonna need a different kind of car. Maybe a minivan. Well, if you want a marriage that thrives, don't make decisions all on your own. The Bible tells us that when we get married, we become one. One in name, one in aim, and one in purpose. And we're so glad you joined us again this weekend for our mixtape series. We're going to be talking about the number one reason for divorce within the first five years of marriage and the number two reason for divorce after the first five years. And God has his plan for money. And we're gonna talk about that here in a little bit. But before we get to that, we want you to listen to this next song by Andy Grammer, because nobody wants to get to the age 85 and regret everything because they spent all their time on things that didn't matter. There was a lie that I believed. The more that I got, the more I'd be free, 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 free. So I've been away making the green See, the more that I get, the more that I need, 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 need So break from my, break from my, break from my soul I got, I got a disease and it's gold Caught us so easy like the common cold Ooh, oh, oh, oh Tossing and tossing and turning around Trying and trying to sweat it all out Kicking the habit that's pulling me down Ooh, oh, oh, oh. I don't wanna be 85 singing Oh no, I think I missed it, I was chasing money I don't wanna be 85 singing Oh no, I got a big house but my heart is ugly Can't take it with you and your whip ain't gon' miss you So wipe off that window and see the bigger picture now I don't wanna be 85 singing Oh no, I think I missed it, I was chasing money There was a dream that I was sold Just get all you can before you get old, 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 old So I bought it all and took out a loan But now that I'm here, I got nothing to show, 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 show Pray for my, pray for my, pray for my soul I got, I got a disease and it's cold Caught it so easy like the common cold Ooh, oh, oh. Tossing and tossing and turning around Trying and trying to sweat it all out Kicking the habit that's pulling me down Ooh, oh, oh. I don't want to be 85 singing Oh no, I think I missed it, I was chasing money I don't want to be 85 singing Oh no, I got a big house but my heart is ugly Can't take it with you and your whip ain't gon' miss you So wipe off that window and see the bigger picture now I don't want to be 85 singing Oh no, I think I missed it, I was chasing money Instead, I was chasing money. I don't wanna be 85 singing. Oh no, I got a big house, but my heart is ugly. I don't wanna be 85. I don't wanna be 85. Oh no, I think I missed it. I was chasing money. I don't wanna be 85 singing. Oh no, I got a big house, but my heart is ugly. I missed it, I was chasing money.
Well, I have loved this mixtape series from the music to the content. It has been incredible. And I want to welcome those who are joining us online, those on TV, and those in person on all of our campuses. Folks, something amazing happened a little over 17 years ago. I got married. And not only did I get married to the woman of my dreams, but something crazy happened. We merged our finances together as one. Now, until that day, I always carried my own wallet. I always had my own finances. I could spend money without asking permission. But from that day forward, everything changed. Now, what you find in married couples is that there's always one person who is a spender and one person who is a saver. Now, my wife, I love her. She happens to be a little bit of a spender. Now, I am a little bit more of a saver. Now, my wife didn't really know this about me until we went on our honeymoon. And in fact, in the airport on the way to our honeymoon, we are sitting and waiting for our airplane to pull up. And my wife looks down at her ticket. And she looks at her ticket and then she looks at me and she says, we're not flying first class? I said, no. She said, but it's our, it's our honeymoon. And every movie that I've ever seen, the newlyweds, they always fly first class. You're not going to make me sit in the back, are you? And I said, yes. I mean, it's so much money to fly first class. There's no way. I mean, you can sit in the back of the plane. You just put your headphones on so you can ignore the crying kids. You keep your elbows in so you don't get run over by the cart. Everything will be fine. And so off we flew to Hawaii, to our honeymoon. And man, it was a great time in Hawaii. Here's a picture of me and my wife in Hawaii. We were so cute back then. Here's a closer picture. And we've been saying through the series that ugly guys can marry beautiful women if they listen well. Obviously, I listen very well, folks. I found the most beautiful woman in all of the world. And we've been married now for over 17 years. Now, on our honeymoon, my wife realized just how cheap I was. Because the first morning, we woke up and like we decided to order room service at this beautiful hotel that we were staying at. And so I only ordered one pineapple and two coffees. And so they roll up this pineapple and these two coffees and their little cart and everything. They put it out for us. And then they gave me the bill. It was $34 for a pineapple, folks. And so after that, every morning, I would wake up early before my wife. I would go downstairs and I would get in my rental car and I would drive to McDonald's. I would pick up breakfast, and then I'd walk through this bougie hotel lobby carrying my Mickey D's bag. And it was such a nice hotel that the people at the front desk, they actually knew me by name. And they would laugh at me as I was walking through the lobby, and they would say, Hey, Mr. Poe. It's the first time I've ever been called Mr. in my whole life. But I didn't really realize that on the islands of Hawaii, everything is expensive. I mean, especially the food, everything is expensive. But being a cheapskate, I figured out that Hawaii has Costco. And Costco has an incredible food court where you can buy hot dogs for only $1.50 and pizza for $2. <laughs> I'm so ashamed to admit this, but we ate at Costco multiple times on our honeymoon. Now, some people would call me cheap. I just call myself very frugal. Now, my wife and I, over the years, we have had to learn how do we manage our money together? Because money issues can cause the worst problems in relationships. And I know that to be true because as I was preparing for this talk, I found so many different statistics, so many different studies that were done. In fact, this lady named Sonia Britt, who's a professor at Kansas State University, here's what she's, she found all about money. Arguments about money are by far the top predictor of divorce. Isn't that true? It's not your kids. It's not your in-laws. It's not sex. No. The top predictor for divorce is how you deal with your money. Now, the interesting thing about that one is it's not about how much money you make. 
Les Parrott, who is actually a psychologist that I love, he wrote this all about money. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. Couples fight about money regardless of what their income is. Now, that's interesting, right? Because it doesn't matter what your financial situation is. Some couples are a little bit more well-off. They argue about whether, where to go on vacation, whether to go to Barbados or whether to go to Europe, while some couples argue whether or not they can afford vacation at all. It doesn't matter how much money you make. Couples fight about money. And you could get a raise. You could have a little bit better financial situation. Still, this is always a hot button issue. That's why Les Parrott also found that 32% of married adults said that money was the most important issue for couples to discuss prior to getting married. Now, this is interesting, right? Most married couples know how hard you fight about money, how oftentimes there's just tension in your relationship. But what most of us don't know is that it's actually a hidden opportunity for success. Ann and Chuck Bentley found in their book, Money Problems, Marriage Solutions, they found this. Here's what they said. Research indicates that married people experience less poverty and more prosperity than any other living arrangement, including being single or living together. A lot of times when we're married and we argue about finances, what do we think? We think, oh man, if I just wasn't in this relationship, my life would be so much better. My financial situation would be so much better if my wife didn't go to Target so much. Maybe that's just me, okay? But we wonder, right, if our situation would just be better. But the opposite is true. When you're married, it provides the opportunity for you to be blessed financially. In fact, David Lionheart, who's a columnist for the New York Times, he found that there is this success sequence that takes place when married couples get together. And they thrive, actually, both economically and socially and also physically. When they're committed to one another and they're faithful, everything begins to get better. Now, there's some tension, right? While this is a successful sequence, it's also the point of the most tension in your relationships because it can actually cause some mini wars as well as it becomes one of those issues that couples get divorced even over. So how is it that we can get the money mix right in our life? What does it take for us to get our money and our financial house in order? That's what we want to address in this mixtape series. Because a lot of times you're going to struggle with money. And the truths that I'm going to share today, they're not exactly my own truths. They're things that I've learned over all of my years all about managing your money well. And I've learned from people around here. I've learned from podcasts, a number of different things. And that's what I want to share today. Now, one disclaimer, this isn't just for married couples. If you are single today, you will probably at some point struggle with how to use your money. So this is for all of us as we learn, how do we manage our finances God's way? How do you manage all those landmines that come with your financial house. Here's what you have to do first. The first thing that you have to do is this. If you're taking notes with me on the Sagebrush app, I would encourage you to take notes today because it will help you a lot. Number one, you have to understand that everything belongs to God. Make no mistake about it. If you want to get your financial house in order, it always starts with your mindset. It always starts with the way that you think. Because if you start your relationship with the attitude of this is his or hers or mine or yours, it will always lead to a battle. It will always lead to a battle because you'll be territorial with your finances. But instead, when you acknowledge that everything belongs to God, it changes everything. We find this truth in the Bible in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 11. Here's what it says. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength 
to all. Now, I love this passage of scripture because this is a prayer that King David prayed. And he prayed this prayer after he had given an offering to build the temple. So here is the king of Israel with like all this wealth and all this money and all this power. And what does he say? He says, everything on, you, on this earth, God, it's yours. Everything belongs to you. You see, David had this mindset that everything that he had was a gift from God. What if we had that same attitude? Don't you think it would change the way that we spend money? Don't you think that we would stop thinking of ourselves as the king of the castle or the queen of the universe? Instead, we would say, no, everything belongs to God, and now I want to honor him. Let me illustrate it this way. Twelve years ago, I came on staff at Sagebrush Church, and I love this church. But twelve years ago, they gave me a Sagebrush credit card. Now... With great power, folks, comes great responsibility. Because with this card in my wallet, I have the power to spend lots of money. But I have to know, the funds that I'm spending, they don't belong to me. They belong first and foremost to God, but they also belong to the people who have given sacrificially to this church. So every time I pull out that sagebrush card... I ask myself a couple questions. I begin to say, does this, does this purchase really honor God? Is this furthering the ministry of the church? Is this helping people to do better ministry? Am I getting the resources that we need to know Christ and to make Christ known? And so I ask myself those questions. And when I ask myself those questions, it changes me. Because I understand that I am just a manager of the funds that I've been given. I'm just a guy who manages what God has given me. So I ask myself those questions because I wanna honor God with everything and with this awesome responsibility that I've been given. And I don't want any little old ladies to hit me with their cane in the lobby. (laughs) Why? Because they've given something special to the Lord. Many people who are here are on fixed incomes at our church. And yet they give very generously to God. And so I want to manage what God's given me, this opportunity and this responsibility well. But you know what's crazy? For a long time, I managed my Sagebrush credit card a lot better than my own finances. I mean, I never thought about pulling out my credit card and charging it here and charging it there. So it really taught me this idea of asking questions first. And now I can say after years of doing this, it's changed me in the way that I handle my personal finances. Because when you see yourself as a manager of the resources that God has given you, it truly changes things forever. And we want to be a good manager of what God's given us. I'm reminded of that story that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents. And he talks about all these servants being given this great responsibility. And the servants who do well with this, they stand before the master. And the master says this in Matthew 25. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Those are the words that I want to hear God say when it comes to the way that I have managed the resources that he's given me. You see, you have to see yourself as just a manager because everything belongs to God. And when you do that, you understand that God comes first. The first thing that comes is, man, I wanna honor God with all my spending, with what he has given me. And then after God, we put other people before ourselves. We say, man, I want to help this person who's in need out. I want to help my wife. I want to help my kids. And when we manage God's resources, when we understand that everything belongs to him, we make wise decisions because we're no longer getting sucked into just spending money like crazy, right? Because we're thinking about it. We're thinking about it at a mindset level, understanding that everything belongs to God. Then after that, the second thing that you have to do is you have to keep no secrets. You have to keep no secrets. 
From time to time, uh, I do premarital counseling around here at the church. And we always talk about money in premarital counseling. And every once in a while, I have a couple that comes in and they go, Pastor, I know we're going to talk about money, but I want you to know up front, we plan to keep our finances separate. We don't ever plan to merge our finances. She has her paycheck. I have mine. We have separate accounts. And we don't talk about it. Well, I always say, let's talk about it. Because our finances are a point of honesty and openness. And when you're not honest about what's going on financially, you're going to find that there's a lot of distrust in your relationship. And you're going to find that that's a fertile ground for secrets. Now, secrets will ruin your relationships. And for the past few months, I have been working in living free around a lot of people from the recovery culture. And there's this phrase that they always say in recovery programs. They say this, you're only as sick as your secrets. Take that in for a second, because that's so true. When you keep secrets from another person, it will make your relationship sick. And that's especially true when it comes to your finances. When you keep secrets from the other person, you will distrust them, you will wonder what's going on. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 12, verse number two, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. What's Jesus saying? Live a life of integrity. Live a life with no secrets. And this is especially true for married couples. Because when you have secrets, when you're not fully honest with the other person, it will destroy your relationship. Why? Because you give the evil one a foothold. And the evil one has a way of twisting things, doesn't he? Especially when it comes to your finances. When you don't have absolute honesty, you begin to wonder. And you begin to wonder how that person's spending money on their own. You begin to get curious about maybe they're not spending money the right way. And then you jump to conclusions, thinking about the the, the fact that they're not thinking about you in the midst of that. And then it drives you to the belief that the other person doesn't actually care about you. That's what the evil one does, right? He twists things. And it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. That's why We have to refuse to keep secrets in our marriage relationships. And that's especially true of our finances. And then after that, I would encourage you, you have to make a plan. You have to make a plan when it comes to your finances. Now, most of us don't like talking about a financial plan. But the Bible has a lot to say about making a plan when it comes to your work, when it comes to your finances. Most of those statements are found in the Proverbs that were written and collected by Solomon. Here's some of my favorites. Here's what it says. Do not love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake and you will have food to spare. Then Proverbs 24 says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Then it says this in Proverbs 6, go to the ant, you sluggard. I love that word. Consider its ways and be wise. So what's the gist of all of these different Proverbs? What are they trying to say? I believe he's saying, don't be lazy. Work very hard. Have a plan for what you're doing. And because you have to take the times where you have a lot or you have a little and you've got to store up for the future. And so having a plan allows you to thrive as a couple. Now make no mistake about it. This world does not want you to have a plan when it comes to your finances. They want you to spend all your money on all the products that you see all the time. Case in point, the impulse line at the grocery store when you check out, right? Because as you go through that like last checkout line, there's all those beautiful impulse buys. You have the chips, you have the candy, you have the sodas, you have the magazines, you have all that stuff that you don't need. 
You have groceries in your cart. You are just fine. You don't need any of that. But they know that it all sells because you might be a little hungry or you might have kids who are screaming in your shopping cart and you will buy it, right? Now, what's interesting about our world today is that people have figured out that impulse buys are everywhere, especially when you go on websites. Because if you are on your favorite website, within about 10 seconds, one of those banner ads will come up on your computer. And you're gonna see that banner ad. And you're gonna try to click it off, but you can't find the X. You're gonna look everywhere. But on that banner ad, it's so strange, right? I feel like they're listening to us all the time. But you will see things that you have talked about. And it will be like this beautiful tropical vacation. And just a few weeks ago, you were talking to your wife about going on vacation. And you'll see this beautiful tropical vacation that will draw you in. Or you'll start thinking back to COVID and how much weight you've gained. And so you'll start seeing all these diet plans that pop up weight loss plans and meal plans and everything else. Or maybe you might be of a certain age, like 44 years old and you're male, and you've started to notice that your hair is not quite as luscious as it used to be. So they will, with their analytics, start showing you Rogaine ads. Not to say that that happens to me, okay? But if you dare, click on one of those ads. If you dare click on one of those ads, you will for the next three months see nothing but vacations, weight loss plans, and plans to regrow your hair. Why? Because they've figured this out. They've figured out how you will impulse buy when you're sitting shopping or just surfing the internet. They don't want you to have a plan. When it comes to your finances, why? Because it benefits their bottom line. So having a financial plan can help you to manage your finances the way that God wants you to. So how is it? And what's some practical steps that you can have a good financial plan with? Let me give you three things that I would recommend. First, you have to set some financial goals. Some financial goals of where you want to be in the future. And there's two types of goals that you have to set. You have to set some short-term goals of where you want to be from six months to one year from now. And then you want to set some longer-term goals, which is where you want to be from one year to five years from now. Some short-term goals might be that you want to pay off a debt, that you want to retire it, or you might want to work a little bit harder so that you can get more money to help your bottom line. Some longer-term goals is, man... I want my kids to one day hopefully go to college. So we're going to start saving up for college. We're going to start saving up for their braces that are very expensive, that I'm going to have to shell out lots of money for one day. You see, you've got to have some financial goals first. Then after you develop some financial goals, you have to sit down and you have to work on a budget. Now, budget is like a four-letter word, right? Nobody likes talking about a budget Because it's no fun to have to sit down to work on a budget to try to figure out what monies are coming in and what monies are going out. But I believe if you sit down and you work on a budget and you have a plan for your finances, you will fight less. You'll work together as a couple to tackle your finances. So you've got to come up with a budget. The final thing that you've got to do is you've got to deal with debt. You got to deal with debt. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 talks about this, and it says, The borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is actually a slave to the lender. This world wants to trap you in debt. You've got to come up with a plan to deal with your debt. We always recommend around here that you do what's called the debt snowball or the debt avalanche, which is systematically to list out all of your debts and then you prioritize the ones that have the highest interest and you start attacking those problems. Now, there's lots of different resources online that you can get for how to do the debt snowball or the debt avalanche, but when you do it and you stay committed, you will get out of debt very fast. Now, I know 
This is really, really hard for all of us around Sagebrush. So we want to make it easier for you. So we put together some homework assignments. In fact, if you go to sagebrush.church forward slash money, we have some work that we want you to do to get financially free. If you go to this website, you might need to take a picture of that website. You need to write it down. But there are three separate resources that we offer to help you. There's a resource on financial management and how to set some good goals. Then we have a budget worksheet for you to fill out a budget worksheet of what's currently coming in and what's going out. And finally, there's a way that you can practice that debt snowball. And if you work on that, I believe that God will move you to a place where you'll be financially free, where you'll stop arguing about money. And instead of attacking one another, I believe you will attack your financial problems. The fourth thing that you have to do, if you want to follow God, if you want to manage your finances God's way, is this. You have to communicate, communicate, communicate. Yes, folks, I did say that three times because this is so important with our finances. You've got to talk about everything that's going on. Think about the worst arguments that you've ever had in your marital relationships or even in the relationships that you've had. Usually it's always a failure to communicate. It's a failure to get on the same page. It's when that credit card statement comes in and there's a charge that the other person didn't know about. Or maybe it's a gift that your wife went out and bought your mom. And you can't really get angry because it's your mom. But it causes tension, right, in your relationship. Or maybe somebody goes out and they sign up for a monthly service where there's this recurring charge every single month. Or maybe the husband goes out to his favorite gym and he finds out for just one dollar, he can sign the whole family up and so for one buck, he signs the whole family up, not realizing that after that month, it's going to be $100 every single month. See, with that, the cure is communication. We got to talk about these things financially. And outside of the budget, things are going to come up. So you as a couple have to agree to talk about purchases. And for some situations, if it's outside of groceries or different things like that, you might have an agreed upon amount that you have a conversation about the other person's spending. For some couples, it's $50. If you spend over $50 outside of the budget, we just need to have a quick conversation so we know where one another's at. And what I would encourage you to do as married couples or even dating couples is when you sit down at your dates, like once a month or maybe even quarterly, sit down and talk about where your finances are at. Have a good conversation because when you do that, you're going to find that you grow together and that's what God wants. God never wanted two people to be separate entities. He wants two lives to become one. I love what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse five. He says, and he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be reunited to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they're one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. So what's Jesus encouraging? He's encouraging that we would be one. Love what Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse 12 says. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And I love that picture because that picture is two people becoming one and then God being that third strand that holds that couple together. Make no mistake about it. The evil one wants to tear your relationship apart. But God wants to hold you together. And when you invite him in, you're going to stop attacking one another. And I believe that you'll start focusing and attacking that problem with your finances. And what you're going to find is that you become a good team. Now, this might surprise you, but this last year... My daughter started high school. I can't believe it. She's in ninth grade now. And she actually this year got on the varsity soccer team. Now she's on the varsity soccer team, right? And it's all these younger kids that are on the team. In fact, this year they had 16 freshmen and eighth graders on the varsity team. They only had one senior 
and then they had five juniors. So we're talking a really young team. So every game that I went to at the beginning, it was like the bad news bears. I mean, they couldn't pass the ball. They were giving the ball away. It was hard to watch. But after some time, it was crazy. They started to, to really work together well. And they started to become a really solid team. They were younger than all the other teams. They weren't quite as big, but they shared the ball well and they passed extremely well. And they just kept getting better and better and better. And finally, they went on a 15-game winning streak. And just this last week, they won the state championship for their high school. I'll take credit for it because I drove her to practice, okay? But no, they won everything. Why? Because they were a solid team. And I believe that that's what God wants for us in our marriages. He wants us to be a team. He wants us to work together. He wants us to be unselfish. How do we do that? You gotta understand first that everything belongs to God. Then after that, you've gotta refuse to keep secrets from one another. You gotta come up with a good plan and then you've gotta communicate often about what's going on. And here's what I know. I know that if you honor God with your finances, that God will honor you with a great marriage. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this message. God, thank you for such a practical message that we all needed to hear on every campus, on TV, as well as on the internet. God, I know everyone needs to hear this message. Because God, you know how hard we struggle with money. We struggle, God, to put you first. We struggle to come with a plan that we actually follow. So God, I pray that we would stop fighting with you, that we'd stop fighting with other people, but God, that we would put you first. And when we put you first, acknowledging that you own everything, everything belongs to you, that you've given us these gifts to manage on planet Earth, God, I pray that we would manage those resources well. I pray, God, for the marriages that are in crisis right now because of money. I pray, God, that they would get the help that they need. I pray, God, that they would turn to you first and foremost and that today would be a day that they have an honest conversation about what's going on. I pray, God, that you'd help them in their time of need. I pray also, God, for the ones who may not know you, that, Lord, they would get right with you that they might come to find that real relationship of knowing your son, Jesus. And God, as a result, I pray that you would turn their very lives upside down. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You might be here today and you're really struggling with your finances and you don't know where to turn for help. If that's you, we would love to have the opportunity to pray for you. Or maybe you're just struggling or you have questions about who God is and what God's plan is for your life. We would love to talk to you today before you leave. The best place that we can do that is over in the first steps room. You just walk right out these double doors down to room 111. There's a big sign on the door that says first steps. There we have our pastors and team members who would love to have a conversation about what's going on in your life. And they'd love to share some next steps that you might need to take. You might need to take that next step of accepting Christ or getting baptized around here or maybe finding a small group where they can keep you accountable to your finances or you might need to come to our Living Free program that meets every Wednesday night here at the church for a service and then afterwards we divide up into groups. If you'd like to get more information about any of those things or to get prayer, stop by the First Steps room. But if you don't have time, you can simply call or text us at 505-922-9200. Pastor will take your phone call or your text message and we'll direct you towards those next steps. Uh, this week, we celebrate Veterans Day. And to honor our veterans around Sagebrush, we're having a hero weekend next weekend on November the 13th and the 14th. So we're gonna honor all those people who are currently serving in our armed forces as well as those who are veterans. So we have these cool commemorative coins that we're going to give all of our veterans as well as those who are currently serving. And so we wanna encourage you, invite your friends, invite your family members to come celebrate with us. And this weekend, we actually start our Hero Box Outreach. Hero Box is an organization that we partner with the church that helps uh, troops who are stationed overseas. 
And so we want to make sure that they have a great Christmas. So what we've done is we've got all these different bags that you can pick up in our lobby today. And we have a list of items that our troops need. So you go out and you fill up the bag with those items and then you bring them back and we're gonna ship those out. And you can help us with the shipping by donating $15 to our Hero Box outreach that we're gonna do. And that would really, really help us out to bless the troops who are stationed all over the world. Uh, we're gonna be collecting those bags for the rest of this month. And you can get all the information at sagebrush.church forward slash hero. Or if you have questions, just stop by the booth on your way out today. Next week, we continue the mixtape series. Todd will be back from Belize. He is down in Belize preaching and encouraging our people down there. But make sure to come back because we're gonna talk all about parenting. On your way out, meet a new friend. God bless you guys now. We'll see you next week. If finances are a constant trigger for a fight with your spouse, please visit the link below to access all the resources Andrew talked about or you can always call or text us at 505-922-9200 to discuss anything you're going through. Don't forget to invite a veteran to services next week. We'll be giving away hero coins to thank them for their service. And please donate to send hero boxes at sagebrush.church hero. Thanks for taking the time out of your weekend to spend time with us. We'll see you next week.